And let's talk first of all about carbonomics, climate change, and ESG. How many more products, as a percentage of overall products, are your existing clients asking for? How, how much more can the space actually grow? Well, I, I think we're just at the beginning in terms of the development here. And you know, as you said, this is our first um, conference dedicated you know, solely, to this, solely to this topic. But if I look at the support and the participation, we've got you know, something like 30 you know, different you have really big company CEOs participating today. Some of them are from the energy space, you know, upstream oil and gas, but also renewables, mobility companies, consumer products companies. So really, you know, right across the economy, and and we've got something you know, in the order of 5,000 um, participants broadly from the in, from the investor universe. So so huge focus and huge interest um, in, in the topic, and you know Biden's. Election obviously gives it further impetus. Um, Richard, we've had some pretty encouraging news in uh, you know over the week. It's it's a vaccine. It's what we've seen with maybe commitment of the U.S. going into climate change. Are we at a point where we're maybe too optimistic that things will move on the vaccine front? That things will move on the climate change front? Well, let's let's start with uh, with climate change. Yeah, you know, Europe has obviously shown you know, real leadership in the space, and the Green Deal is just another example of it. The UK is is certainly doing its bit, but but over the last you know, period of time, we've seen China you know, really commit to to net zero. You know, Biden has said what what, what he said, and we, we, we'll have to see how this plays out in the US. You know, obviously, if if Biden had if, if the blue wave had actually happened, and he'd had you know, full control of you know, all. Um, you know, both Congress and and, and the Senate, you know, that would have been an easier p path for him. So, you know, if he doesn't get the Senate, you know, he'll need to do this on a on a cross party basis. But there's obviously a lot that the president can do, you know, without you know Congress, um, you know, through regulation, through appointments of of, of personnel, and you know, and clearly, you know, the U.S. is moving in, in that direction. But I, but I think the important point is that you know the world is. He's obviously going to be able to move more quickly if it has you know, good policy support and good government support. But I, I don't think the world's going to wait um, for that. You see society broadly you know, supporting the move in this direction. You see you know, capital flowing towards ESG-friendly um, products. I mean, you know, we would argue that the cost of capital for an environmentally um, friendly project is is lower than the cost of capital for a for a carbon heavy uh, project and so you, you mm. you're seeing capital moving in that direction investors broadly are demanding it and 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 so that's the way that the economy is going and so I think I think we're at the beginning of this journey I think there's a huge opportunity um, you know, both for investment spending and and this won't have to sit on government balance sheets you know this can come largely from from the private sector you yeah, that will lead mm -hmm. to I believe meaningful. We believe meaningful job creation over the next period of time. You just think of the inv infrastructure spend that's required and the type of jobs that can get thrown off by that 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 infrastructure build. And so I think it's a terrific opportunity, and and it'll help you know drive the recovery from what we're all going through right now. I hear uh, from a lot of policymakers, you know, the need for bigger and better carbon markets or better functioning carbon markets. What's the role in banks in that? I think, look, this is a really important topic. You know, carbon pricing here you know, has been a topic that's been with us for some time. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, it, it's really not been that successful. So you look at the average carbon price, and it obviously varies around the world, but the average carbon price is you know, order of magnitude, you know, three three dollars um, right now. You know, that needs to get you know much closer to sort of seventy five, you know, hundred dollars. I mean, that's where the European policymakers would like to see it. And there's a there's the potential for a mandatory drive at this. The uh, the border tax that the EU talks about, we'll see if they can get that done. But that that would obviously be a, a move in the, in the right direction. And in many ways, it makes sense. If you're going to force your economy to go to net zero, you know, why would you expose it to carbon leakage from other parts of the world? And, and so if carbon unfriendly products are going to be coming into that economy, Having a, a border tax, you can see how that works. But but obviously that's a, a complicated thing to get resolved. 
the U.S. position now makes it potentially more likely. So, so that's you know one drive. But but then there are obviously you know voluntary markets, and you know from a consumer point of view, consumers wanting to have uh, net zero carbon products, corporates wanting to get to net zero, and you see the list of corporates that are signing up to those commitments yeah. you know, growing day by day. And so trading carbon is going to be for real. The demand for it is going to, is going to grow. And, and, and so the question is, how do we bring this together in one place? This is a real opportunity for, for London as a financial yeah. center. If, we, if London could, could you know, be the center of a global carbon market which was deep, which was liquid, which was accessible, where you know there were you know, markets, OTC markets potentially, but but markets you know, with, with with common standards and and structures and and you know, so people could you know satisfy their needs whether they're buyers yeah. or sellers, and I, and I think we're going to see that grow. Um, Richard, when you look at you know what the fourth quarter has been um, like so far for your bankers and traders. What can you tell us about volatility? What can you tell us about, you know, what's in the pipeline if we do have encouraging news uh, for the vaccine? If we have it sooner than expected, will, will, does it mean much more activity with IPOs, M&A and the like? Yeah, look, you know, throughout this year, there's, there's been a huge amount of activity, and you've seen that in, in bank results. You know, that, that activity clearly continues. The, rec the speed of recovery, the pace of recovery, you know, continues to be strong and robust. You know, we've, we've all seen the vaccine news of the week. The expectation is that we'll see you know, a lot more vaccine news over the, over, the, over the coming weeks. And so we, I think what we can see now is a bridge to sometime next year, let's call it the spring, um, you know, and, and this vaccine really being deployed you know, broadly by that point in, in time. And, and so really the beginning of being able to get back to a you know, more normal existence and starting to put you know, some of the lockdowns that we're currently going through you know, behind us. So, so you can start to see a bridge. Now, we'll have to see how this plays out, but, but I think you can, you can see that. And that was obviously a great accelerator to the markets you know, this week. We'll continue, we'll con continue to see that. Uh, but I think there are two things you need to think about. We saw great UK data, but from a very, very low level, and I think that's broadly the case around around the world. And and so as we go into next year, it's still going to be a year of of recovery, of growth, albeit from relatively low levels. We shifted mm -hmm. our S and P. Um, forecast for for 21 yesterday, uh, and you've seen those numbers. But but broadly, uh, you know, I think equity markets, this is capital appreciation plus dividends. You know, somewhere in the high teens in terms of driving returns next year, quite possible. Um, yeah, albeit from you know from you know, relatively low positions. I, I think the transition. Yeah. I think this is you know this is maybe the the, the, the real key theme here. You know, transition and rotation. You know, the performance year to date has been you know, really driven by those companies, as we've seen, which would thrive and prosper in an uh, acceleration towards a digital world, and that'll continue. Those are secular growth trends. Yeah, but companies which have really prospered from a sort of stay at home economy, if I can use that phrase. But as things start to open up again and people see the prospects for opening up as we go into, as we go into next year, there's clearly the chance for those companies to rebound. So if you look at the performance of some of the airline stocks, um, Travel stocks, leisure stocks. You know, over the last you know few days, as this vaccine news has come through, yeah, you know, that's been significant. So, yeah, you know, so growth in those um, company share prices, but albeit from relatively low levels, and that'll drive some of those returns that we're talking about as we go into as we go into next year.